Um, the other day, I was hanging out with my nephews, um, and they go to the same school. One of them's in fourth grade or third grade, and another one's in fifth grade. And so one of them, they got promoted from fifth grade to sixth grade. And, and the other one, they wanted to see their older brother's ceremony. And he should have been allowed to leave class early and watch, and he did leave class early to watch. But apparently, some adults told him to go back to class. And the worst part was some of his friends he was with weren't told to go back to class and they were allowed to watch. So my younger nephew, on the other hand, he did the right thing. He listened to the adults, but he didn't get to watch. Now, why do I bring this up? We're all taught to do the right thing. And hopefully we would all agree it's good to do the right thing. It's good to tell the truth It's good to include others who are shy into our friend group. It's good to obey our parents. Usually, doing the right thing is good for us. But what happens when you do the right thing, but it doesn't work out, like my nephew? Maybe you can uh, relate to that somehow. Maybe you've done the right thing, but it just doesn't work out in the way that you want. What if you're in a situation where you'd get in trouble for telling the truth? Or what if you realize it's a lot of work to be friends with someone that's hard to love? Or what if obeying your parents means your brother or sister gets the better of you? If you're asking these questions like me, the Bible tells us exactly what to do and how to feel when life is unfair, especially for doing the right thing. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37. It's the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 37. And when you're there, I would like to ask you to stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's word. And please help your neighbor find their place if you notice that they need help. And even if you don't have a Bible, we ask that you stand and share with someone near you as a sign of reverence for God's word. Now, normally, I'd ask you all to read with me, and it would be the seventh graders' first time reading the whole passage with me. But because, one, it's a really long passage, and secondly, I really want you to soak in the narrative of Joseph that we're about to read just for this week, I'll read it myself. But please listen and follow along closely. This is the reading of God's word from Genesis chapter 37. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was a son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. 
So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he went from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And the man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let, us, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? And they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol, to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Amen. Please be seated. What we just read is the beginning of an epic story, the story of the life of Joseph. And if you grew up in church, this is a story that you probably heard and hopefully it's familiar with you. The main tension that we see is that bad things happen to Joseph even though he does the right thing. Joseph is portrayed as honest, faithful, and obedient. But by the chapter's end, his brothers sell him into slavery, never to see him again. What are we supposed to make of this? How can this be fair? I think we can learn at least two things from this passage, and these two things will serve as the outline for our sermon. And so if you're taking notes, these are the two points of our sermon. You can go ahead and write them down in your notebook. If you're a seventh grader and you just got your pen and notebook, you can go ahead and open that up and write these down. The first point is that the godly are hated by sinners. The godly are hated by sinners. And the second point is that the godly are used by God. The godly are used by God. And all I mean by a godly person is someone who loves and follows God. It's not just someone who wants to do the right thing just to look good or to be kind, but they want to do it because they love God. They want to please God because they've been saved by God. 
Again, our first point for today is that the godly are hated by sinners. When Joseph doesn't even do anything wrong, his brothers hate him. Actually, they hate him for doing the right thing. In our passage, there are at least three examples that highlight Joseph's godliness that fuel his brother's hatred of him. If you look down at verse 2, it says in the second half that Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, a more literal translation would be that he reported their evil deeds to their father, meaning Joseph's brothers were doing things that they shouldn't have. Some argue that Joseph is portrayed negatively here because he's a tattletale, right? We don't like tattletales. But I would argue that the author of Genesis is saying Joseph did the right thing in obeying his father. Sure, if the standard is to be accepted by your friends or your peers, it sucks to be the one to report them to the teacher if they cheat on a test. But if the standard is to be righteous, if the standard is to be right before God, then it's the right thing to report it. Joseph did the right thing and his brothers hated him for it. And what made it worse was that his dad, Jacob, showed favoritism to him. His dad gave him a colorful robe, and if you look down at verse 4 with me, it says that the brothers hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. That's the first example. The second example comes immediately in verses 5 to 11. Joseph has two extremely vivid dreams that aren't just any dreams, but they're dreams that are given to him by God. And Joseph reports these dreams. In one dream, he says that his brother's sheaves, which is an agricultural picture, they're bundles of grain, they bow down to Joseph's while Joseph's stood upright. And in the second dream, the sun, moon, and 11 stars, which again represented Joseph's family, bow down to him. Like in the first example, some try to find a reason to say that this paints Joseph in a negative light. They interpret this as Joseph showing off and acting superior in a condescending way, but there's nothing in the passage that indicates that. To interpret it this way would be to read something into the Bible that isn't there. On the contrary, I believe Joseph was obligated or required to reveal his dreams. His dreams were from God, were they not? And it's always been the responsibility of God's people to share what God shows them. This is why the church has people give testimonies of what God's done in their life before they're baptized or confirmed. This is why Jesus commands us to evangelize or share the gospel with our non-Christian friends and family. And this is why God's people are always to tell the truth including confessing our sins or wrongdoing to one another, that we might receive grace. Another reason I believe Joseph didn't do anything wrong here is because of his dad's, Jacob's, response. After the second dream, it says in verse 10 that Joseph's father rebuked him. That word rebuke, it means chastise or to speak strongly against as if you're disciplining them. If you're Korean, it's honing them, right? That's what rebuke means. But then in verse 11, it says that his father kept the saying in mind. Jacob's response changed to when Joseph shared about his dream. Maybe Jacob was upset at first. How can my son, how can I bow down to my son? But as he kept sharing, maybe Jacob had flashbacks to earlier in his life when he had dreams and visions himself. And wouldn't it be possible that he realized Joseph wasn't just showing off, but simply reporting what God showed him? The final and third example is the longest one and covers verses 12 to 36, the rest of the chapter. Jacob sent Joseph to look for his brothers. So it says in verse 14 that Joseph was sent from the Valley of Hebron which is a legitimate city, if you look it up, to Shechem, which is also another historical city. And when he didn't find them at Shechem, someone informed him that they went to Dothan. Now, the distance between Hebron to Dothan 
it would have been about 63 miles. 63 miles. They didn't have cars back then. And I did the math without any brakes and assuming Joseph didn't slow down and he walked at a three to four mile an hour rate, this would have taken him about 20 hours. 20 hours. And if he did take breaks like a normal person, it would have been a couple of days. And guess what? He wasn't sure if he was going to find his brother. So he left home into the wilderness to other cities to look for his brother without knowing whether he would find them. If your parents told you to walk 50 miles by foot to look for your younger brother or sister or your older brother or sister, what would you do? I don't know what you'd do, but I wouldn't go. I'd be tired. I'd just stay in bed or play video games. But we know what Joseph did. Joseph didn't complain. Joseph didn't try to negotiate his way out of it. Joseph went as soon as his father Jacob told him to. And how was Joseph's faithfulness, how was his obedience paid back to him? Look down at verse 18 with me. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. To kill him. Imagine traveling for days looking for your brother or sister that you love, that you want to make sure they're okay. And you finally find them. You're happy. But you have no idea they want to kill you. When your siblings annoy you, maybe you you might punch them, right? But kill them. That's next level. But that's just how evil Joseph's brothers were. And you know what comes next. Look down at verse 23. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. We need to pause right there. Imagine having no sense of right or wrong to the point of being able to eat happily while figuring out how to kill someone. I don't know about you, but when I do something wrong and I know that it's wrong, I can't eat. Like my stomach feels weird. But they can eat just fine. And this is absolutely disgusting. But by God's providence, the fact that God is in control of everything, he directs it another way. For some reason, The brothers changed their minds and they listened to their brother Judah who suggests that they instead sell Joseph to merchants they see in the distance. And they sell him for 20 shekels of silver. And I I looked it up and it's about $20 in today's amount of money. Imagine selling your sibling for $20 to never see them again. In all three situations, the report, the dreams, and the pursuit to Dothan. Joseph is not treated in the way that he deserved. He was obedient, he was honest, he was selfless, and yet his brother sought to kill him. Why? Because the godly are hated by sinners. People who follow God hate, are hated by those who don't follow God. Why do sinners hate followers of God? Well, this text, it says the brothers were jealous of Jacob's favoritism towards Joseph. Sinners are jealous of the blessedness given to godly people by God. And the text also portrays the brothers as disobedient and wicked. They're sinful. When Joseph tells on them, and that's the right thing to do, their lifestyle of sin is threatened. Joseph got in the way of their fun, quote unquote. In Joseph and his brothers, we see two groups. The first group are the godly, who are persecuted or hated or mistreated for following God. This might look like people making fun of you for paying attention during a sermon. Second, 
The second group is the ungodly who hate the godly. You might be the one who makes fun of others for paying attention during the sermon. So let me ask, which group do you belong to? And as you're trying to figure that out for yourself, more than that, which group would other people say that you belong to? Because I think that's more indicative of where you're truly at. Are you the one who follows God? Are you the, or are you the one that hates those who ruin your fun because they're following God and they want you to follow God? Maybe it's your parents that you don't like because they tell you to go to church. Or maybe it's your friends who tell you to stop cussing at school. If you're committed to God, this means that if you love God, you can expect to receive hatred and jealousy from those that don't love God. If you follow the law because you trust in what God commands and you want to please him because he's saved you, people will hate you. Growing up, people made fun of me at school for being a quote-unquote good kid. I wasn't even a good kid, so I don't know why they said that. But for some reason, they didn't like me. They might bully you if you reported someone for doing drugs or for telling them to be kinder to another student. Or if you honestly share what God has placed on your heart, people might view you as too serious or not fun. They might not invite you to their parties. They might treat you a little differently than everyone else. Or it may be if you selflessly serve someone else without expecting anything back. I hope no one tries to kill you. But that has happened before in Christian history many times. One example would be missionary Jim Elliot, who died at the hands of the people he spent his whole life trying to bring the gospel to. The godly are hated by sinners. And if you have any sort of reasonable bone in your body, I hope you think that this is very unfair. Because not only does this seem unfair, but it feels pointless. Because what can possibly motivate someone to be honest, to be obedient, to be faithful, if they always get the short end of the stick? And this brings us to our second point, the godly are used by God. The godly are used by God. The godly are the ones whom God uses to accomplish his purposes. The godly are the ones whom God uses to spread the gospel in this world. If you're joining us for the first time in our Genesis series, it might not be so clear from the text how God is using Joseph, but if we consider the entire Bible, we can see that it's very clear God uses Joseph because of his godliness. Look down at verse 38 with me. Then the Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. All right, let's do some Bible trivia. What book comes after Genesis? Exodus, excellent, all right. Who led Israel out of slavery from Egypt in the book of Exodus? Moses, very good. Good soil is teaching you good things, Moses. Now, this might be a little harder. Do you know how many years passed from when Joseph was sold to Egypt here and to when Moses led them out? Any guesses? I'll take some guesses. How many years? 400, around 400, very good. It was exactly 430 years, but around 400 years. No, it's 430 years. Now keep your finger on Genesis 37, because we'll come back to it, and turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. As you're turning there, let me provide some background information for you. Genesis 15 is where God made a promise 
to Abraham. And let's look at what God said as part of this promise or prophecy of what will happen to Abraham's descendants. Look down at verse 13. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Do you see the connection here? Abraham is Joseph's great grandfather. And the time that he received this promise to when Joseph is sold into slavery, it's almost 200 years. But do you see the connection? Part of God's plan is laid out in Genesis 15. We don't know how it's going to happen, but God says this is going to happen. You're going to go to a foreign nation. You're going to be a servant to them. But after about 400 years, you're going to be taken out and you're going to take their possessions with them the offspring of Abraham, which is the nation of Israel, which are the sons of Jacob, will be servants in a land that isn't theirs. Hint, that's Egypt. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. The people of God going to Egypt and spending time there was always a part of God's plan. And in Genesis 37, we see the beginning of this promise, of this prophecy unfolding. And who is it unfolding through? Who is it that God's using? How do they get to Egypt in the first place? It's through Joseph. It's through Joseph. What an honor. God chose to use Joseph like this. And we read of it now in Genesis 37 because of Joseph's godliness. Joseph did everything right and it made his brothers hate him. But what made it worth it was that God was on his side. He was hated by his brothers, but he was loved by God. His brothers tried to kill him, but he was protected by God. And as you'll see later on in our Joseph series, he was chosen by God to accomplish great things because of his godliness. Cross seeds, don't you want to be used by God for his purposes? Don't you want to be used by God for his glory? Don't you want to be used by God so that people are saved? And this is a lesson for all of us who say we're Christian today. Just because the world hates you, it doesn't mean God hates you. It might actually mean he's on your side and that he's working through you to accomplish something great, not for yourself or the people around you, but for him. On the flip side, if your life is always easy and comfortable and everyone likes you all the time, it might mean you're not always living for God. It might mean you're not offering yourself up to be used by him. But what greater honor is there than being included in God's plan of redemption for this world. Friends, the call is to embrace suffering as a confirmation that you are following God. If people hate you because you're following God, it's okay. And as your pastor, I would say that's great because wouldn't you rather have God's approval than people's approval, than social media's approval, then your friend's approval, then your pastor's or parent's approval, wouldn't you rather have God's approval? What greater honor is there than following in the footsteps of Jesus? Notice I didn't say Joseph, I said Jesus. Why do I mention Jesus? It's because when we read about Joseph, we see shadows and hints of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Lord and Savior that we sing about every Sunday morning. You see, Joseph's brothers conspired against him when he did nothing wrong. The Pharisees, the chief priests, they conspired against Jesus when he did nothing wrong. Both Joseph and Jesus were stripped of their clothes at the hands of sinners. Both Joseph and Jesus were sold for some pieces of silver. And both didn't fight back as they were sent on their way 
Joseph to slavery in Egypt and Jesus to his death on the cross. But that's where the similarity ends because Jacob, Joseph's earthly father, sent Joseph on a mission to look for his brothers, not expecting that harm would come to his son. But our heavenly father, he purposefully sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, on a mission to die on the cross so that every sinner who believes in him would be forgiven and have eternal life. Jesus suffered when he didn't deserve to, but it led to salvation for all who believe in him. And even though Joseph is portrayed as righteous or blameless in this text, we know from Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that Joseph too was a sinner. Jesus is the only human who is truly sinless. He is the only one who is truly godly. And this is why he was the only one who could accomplish the plan of God in its fullness, which was to save sinners for God's glory. Jesus was able to accomplish God's plan because he was truly righteous. Jesus never sinned. His godliness was the reason sinners hated him, but it was also the reason that allowed him to be used by the Father in the gospel story. It was the reason that the church extends the gospel to all people today. And this gospel works not if you outweigh your bad deeds with good ones. It actually doesn't. It works not because you have Christian parents who pray for you, It works not because you go to church and you serve and you sit through a service every week. It works not because of what you do, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. And the gospel can be at work in your life if you have faith. If you have faith. Now, I hope some of you don't feel too guilty if you identify more with Joseph's brothers than Joseph. But I want to speak to you if you feel that way. If you identify more with Joseph's brothers this morning than Joseph, then maybe you feel the sting of your sin. Maybe you recognize that you deserve what sinners deserve, which is what Joseph actually received, which is a call to death and judgment And maybe you feel guilty for that. Well, I want to remind you that no one is perfect, so welcome to the club. But the call to you is to turn to Christ in faith and receive forgiveness, to be made a new creation. If you've placed your faith in Jesus and you're a Christian, don't you want to be used by God like Joseph? Don't you want to be used by God like Jesus? Don't you want to take part in what God will do in this world? Here are some ways God can use your godliness. He can use your obedience to your parents to encourage them in your faith or in their faith. You know, if your parents are Christian, they need encouragement too. And you following them and what they say, especially if it's good for you or you trust them, it can be an encouragement to them. He can use your kindness to all your classmates at school to cause them to wonder about your faith. If they see you cussing up a storm, bullying other people, counting other people out, why would they think you're any different from other non-Christians? If you as a Christian are kind to all your classmates, it'll cause them to wonder about what drives your life. He can use your service at church to provide visual proof of the gospel actually working to change people, even to people who aren't Christian. He can use your welcoming a newcomer to show them his love. He can use your excellence in sound and audio and visuals to bring people's attention to his word. He can use your evangelism or sharing of the gospel to awaken spiritually dead hearts to spiritual life in Jesus. He can use your prayers He can use your prayers 
to effectively change the world. Friend, if you're godly, if you want to be godly, maybe you won't always be treated well, even for doing the right things. But you'll be able to see amazing things. You'll be able to see people who hated God before come to profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Maybe you'll be persecuted or wrongly accused for something you didn't do, but you'll experience the comfort of God like you never did before in a way that not everyone in this world will. Maybe you'll feel slowed down in your life goals if you take care of the people around you, but you'll have great treasures in heaven waiting for you, given to you by your God. It might be hard in your life on earth, but you'll have eternal life. Cross seeds, Joseph's life may not look like something you want at first, but if you wanna be used by God, and if you trust God, it should be the life you want. None of us wanna be hated, especially if we didn't do anything wrong. No one wants to be hated by sinners for doing the right thing, but don't you consider being used by God as so much greater. Be faithful like Joseph, and you will be used by God. You will see great things, and you will grow more sure of God's presence in your life. Life on earth won't always be easy or comfortable, but if you are in Christ by faith, you can rest assured that this difficult road we call life leads to eternal life. Let's pray.